and we are live. Thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Martin. I'm part of the team at Readsy, based here in London. Readsy is a marketplace that brings together the world of the best publishing professionals uh, and helps them meet up uh, with authors and help them write, publish, and market better books. Uh, today, we're having a very special Readsy live. Uh, dipping into the world of nonfiction, which I know is an area we sometimes neglect uh, more than I'd like, but uh, I think you'll be pleased with the one we have today. Uh, we have on literary agent Max Sinsheimer, uh, who will be talking to us about querying nonfiction. That's the process of uh, taking your book idea or your, your nonfiction book uh, and pitching it all the way up the publishing ladder through agents and uh, publishers. Well, I'm not fully uh, cognizant of uh, all, the, all the ins and outs uh, a publishing non-fiction, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure Max will fill us in. Uh, while we wait for him to join us, please, uh, in the chat box, uh, do let us know where you're coming from uh, and whether you are indeed uh, a writer of non-fiction. I see we have uh, Bob Thompson from Big Fork, Minnesota, H.E. Uh, Scott from White Rock, B.C., British Columbia, Canada. Um, what else? Who, who else? Who else? Uh, we've got some questions coming in already. Fantastic. We'll be having a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for Max, uh, do put them in the chat there. I'll try to keep a track of it. But if I don't uh, find them at the end during the Q&A, just ask it again. Uh, Nina from New York. Uh, Bernice, good to see you again, Bernice, from North Brunswick, New Jersey, in the good old US of A. Uh, H.E. Professor Dr. Shamir Ali. Thank you for joining us today. Sophia Aves uh, from Brisbane. Nice early, early morning in Brisbane. Uh, Lucas Novotny from Brighton, uh, fantastic. Kadim Baylor from Canada, great. Good to see so many people joining in. I see a good number of uh, nonfiction writers here as well, as well as some memoirists. Uh, I guess we'll be asking Max later, perhaps, to help us uh, distinguish whether whether memoir is considered nonfiction or whether it's own unique thing. I've heard uh, certain things, but it'd be good to uh, hear it from the horse's mouth. Uh, well, we have Tiny Ordinary Days from New Zealand. Thank you for waking up so early and joining us. I really appreciate when we see uh, such an international crowd here, folks from all over the world. Jonathan from uh, a tiny village called Los Angeles, California. First time non-fiction author. Welcome, Jonathan. Glad you can join us. Uh, if this is your first Readsy Live, it's basically a live stream where we bring on professionals from the Readsy marketplace to talk to you about some sort of writing or publishing topic. Uh, Max is literary agent, but he's also a uh, an editor for hire here at Readsy, uh, and yeah. So if you you are curious, uh, you can check out his profile in the description below, uh, and maybe hire him to help you out. Um, yeah, I see that some of you have already left a thumbs up for this video. I really appreciate that; it does help us. Uh, so if you uh, take it, take my word for it, and. Uh, I believe that this is going to be a good one. Please uh, feel free to give this video a like. Um, it'll help us uh, get the word out about our channel. And if you're not already subscribed to the Readsy YouTube channel, please do. Uh, we bring out new content every single week. Uh, not just these live webinars, but uh, videos created by Shaylin, who's uh, uh, an author who works with us, uh, who's our, our in-house YouTuber. Uh, lots of great advice on both writing and publishing. So uh, yeah, do, do smash that subscribe button. Uh, we have Beverly Rose from Portland, Oregon. Uh, Philippe from Kidderminster in the UK. I don't know where it is, but uh, I imagine they've got a big church there or a cathedral, as I suspect minsters have. Uh, Cheryl from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Author of two award-winning travel books and working on two non-fiction books currently. Fantastic. So hopefully this is uh, within your wheelhouse, uh, within your area of interest. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I notice now that it is 8 p.m. where I am here in the UK, which means uh, it's 3 p.m. Uh, over in the East Coast, midday in the West Coast. I think like five or so in Australia, three in Singapore and Hong Kong and China. Uh, let me introduce my guest, uh, who is a literary agent and editor available on the Readsy Marketplace. Uh, having started his career at Oxford University Press, that's where he commissioned and edited their Food Companion series. In 2016, he opened a boutique literary agency with a focus on representing adult nonfiction. Uh, today, he's here to talk to us about querying nonfiction. Please uh, welcome Max Sinsheimer. Max, how are you doing? Doing well. Uh, thank you so much, Martin, for that kind introduction. And uh, uh, I am currently traveling in Denver. I don't normally work out of a WeWork, uh, but we're adapting. <laughs> and uh, hopefully the signal remains strong. Oh, nice. Well, seeing as you're there, what is a Denver omelette? 
I'm passing through Denver. I actually don't know. <laughs> a Denver omelet. Uh, maybe we could get one of the uh, listeners to put it in the chat. Yeah, if anyone's from uh, the sort of Rockies, I thought, you know, as a former editor of Oxford's Big Guide to Omelets, you may have known. I know. You've, you've left me flat-footed. This is not a great start, Martin. Can we, can we start all over? <laughs> Well, okay, so we know you don't know omelettes, but uh, hopefully uh, you have plenty to share with us uh, about writing and publishing uh, and getting uh, nonfiction titles bought and represented. Um, I know there's a lot to get on with. There's a bit of housekeeping I'd like to share. Uh, this video here will be um, uh, kept here. It's live streaming, but you can always come back to this page and rewatch it whenever you like. There will be a slide deck, a little PowerPoint presentation that Max is sharing. Uh, we won't be able to send out the presentation, but you can come back to this video and hit the space bar to pause it whenever you want. So you effectively have access to it forever. Uh, if you notice on the chat, I pinned a note at the top uh, about what to do if the stream gets interrupted. Uh, if anyone has been following a lot of our uh, all, all the streams we do here, you may know that my internet is currently not amazing. And so there's a, there's a non-zero chance that this might cut off at some point in the middle. If that does happen, uh, there's a link to the Reedsy YouTube channel where we'll quickly begin another stream. So uh, if it looks like we've disappeared or frozen for about half a minute, uh, head to that and sort of let everyone know. Okay, enough housekeeping. There'll be a Q&A uh, where I'll see you at the end. Uh, yeah, Max, let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, uh, I'll be in the wings. Cool. Uh, all right, we've got a lot to get through. Um, so I'm probably going to try to move this along. Uh, but as Martin mentioned, there's a QA and a at the end. Um, so I wanted to uh, start by acknowledging that landing a traditional publishing deal is hard. Um, many of you write books out of a per personal passion for your subject, you know, maybe uh, writing in general. You probably have research skills, some facility with language. You can write persuasively. You know how to borrow storytelling elements from fiction to kind of suck readers in to your narrative. Um, but publishers also need authors to have business skills to help them position and sell their books. And that is not fair. It's like asking Alex Morgan to both be really good at soccer and really good at analyzing you know, viewership trends or developing World Cup marketing campaigns. Unfortunately, uh, it's where the industry is at right now, and it's not likely to change anytime soon. So hopefully, uh, this presentation will help you understand how to make the business case for your book more effectively. And one caveat I'll just note before we get too far in, um, not everything I say uh, will apply to every nonfiction project. That's just kind of the nature of tossing in, you know, uh, spiritual books and philosophy and biography um, and history and uh, maybe photography books. Um, it's just a really big bucket uh, that we just call nonfiction. Um, and there are, you know, some differences. And I think Google is your friend and writing groups are your friend and um, conferences are your friend. Um, so, you know, do your research and, and take everything I say with, with a, a little bit of salt. Okay. So let's start by thinking about how is querying nonfiction different from querying fiction. Um, with nonfiction, your authority matters as much as the writing. So with, with fiction, I think authors can stand more in the shadows of their writing. And we can get into this uh, more a little bit later. Nonfiction queries, uh, I think, should have a thesis, a, a why it matters message. And by contrast, um, I think fiction queries tend to focus more on describing what happens, you know, the plot summary, than necessarily why it matters. Um, you know, so the why it matters message for prescriptive nonfiction like cookbooks or self-help books, um, I think it can be about improving readers' lives. Um, and with narrative nonfiction, like history or biography, I think it tends to be more about helping the reader understand the forces that have shaped their world or will shape their world going forward. That's kind of a broad generalization, but um, I think that's, that's kind of um, apt for most projects. Uh, nonfiction queries also need a book proposal um, to accompany the query letter, whereas fiction queries usually just need the query letter. And that's because fiction is usually sold on the basis of a complete manuscript. 
you generally don't need that for fiction, uh, for nonfiction. You just need one to two really good sample chapters. There is an exception to that. Um, I think most memoir is sold on the basis of a complete manuscript. Um, it gets treated a little bit more like fiction there. Um, okay, so let's go to the piece that's actually common to both nonfiction and fiction queries, the query letter, the dreaded query letter. I also really like cartoons, uh, so I expect a lot of cartoons in this presentation. Um, okay, so there is definitely a strong networking component to referrals from existing clients. I thought it would be helpful though to, you know, to review a really excellent query letter that I received from the proverbial slush pile. So I didn't know Craig uh, until I received this email um, and I signed him the next week. And so I thought maybe let's dissect why, let's try to get specific. All right, so the first thing um, in, a, in a good query letter is personalization, right? It's sort of the most basic bar you need to clear um, to give agents the common courtesy of using their name correctly um, and assuring them that you chose to reach out to them specifically. So, you know, this is, again, probably advice you've heard before, but don't, don't write dear agent, don't write to whom it may concern, don't just launch in with no, you know, greeting, and then do some light stalking. Look at other books um, that this agent has represented that you like, or think about how your book fits into their you know, um, ex expressed interests um, in terms of what they want to acquire going forward. So in short, you know, find something to admire. And I have definitely seen authors go overboard with the flattery. Um, my manuscript wish list bio has a photo, photo of me eating ice cream. Um, and I've had a lot of authors you know, open with complimenting me on my choice of a waffle cone, which like feels a little much, uh, but listen, agents are human. Um, err in the direction of flattery. Um, and so, you know, you can see in his greeting, uh, he read my manuscript wish list. Um, he knows that I'm interested in food and place uh, specific narratives. Um, he, you know, also looked at my GC website. Um, he knows I'm interested in environmental issues and his project fits my interests. Okay, bar cleared. Uh, all right, so the next, the next uh, thing I think a good query has, it, it has a good hook that tells me the core concept as concisely and compellingly as possible. So in Craig's case, it kind of reads like a thesis, a you know, why it matters statement. Um, what if part of the solution to overfishing our oceans was to make seafood soups? That's, you know, tell me more, Craig. Like I, I, I grew up in New England, I'm like, I'm, I'm in. Um, and you know, I think, I think this is the hardest part. Um, honestly, that that hook is really difficult for for authors um, because it's it's just hard to distill your precious three hundred page baby down to a line. Um, and I always expect to have to rewrite the hook before submitting to publishers. Um, but I, I do need authors to give it their best shot um, because if they just go straight into a description of their book. Uh, it kind of tells me that they aren't sure what makes their book interesting to readers. And that then makes me worry that they don't know their audience or worse, they might have a field of dreams fantasy that, it, you know, if you just write it, the readers will come. Um, and, you know, I think probably if you've done a little bit of research, you, you, you know that um, there's something like 3 million books that are published in the U.S. alone. Uh, 2 million self-published, about a million um, published by traditional publishers. Um, and books don't just break out uh, because you happen to write it. Um, so, you know, you have, to, you have to really know your audience and we'll get more into that too later. Um, but yeah, I really like this concise, compelling hook. Um, and uh, all right, so let's move on to the next. All right. So I think the two, two of the most important questions uh, your query letter and book proposal need to answer are why this book and why now? And there needs to be some evidence of need, some way for the publisher to say to the media and to readers, hey, pay attention. This is important. Um, 
And it's very clear uh, if you if you read Craig's um, next paragraph here, uh, what the importance, what the evidence of need is. Um, America imports 90% of its seafood from questionable sources, but we have really healthy and sustainable domestic fisheries. We need to change habits. And his cookbook is you know, squarely aimed at doing that. Um, so my caveat here is that um, I think a lot of authors confuse a market gap with evidence of need. Just because a topic hasn't been written about in a book you know, yet, that doesn't mean it needs to be. Some things people just don't want to read about. So I, I see this a lot with biographies, honestly, of, of like really minor historical actors. You know, someone will pitch me the first biography of the Secretary of Commerce under President Taft or something. And that's, it's just not likely to sell, except maybe to a very like narrow slice of historians. Um, so, you know, you, you have to kind of pair, pair that, that evidence of need with uh, a receptive, you know, audience, some, some proof of market. Um, all right, so let's get to the book description. So the thing to remember with how you describe your book in a query letter is that a query letter is just an appetizer. You know, the book proposal is the entree. You don't need to cover everything um, in your book, in the query letter. And if you just say enough to get the agent interested, you know, I promise they will read the full overview, the chapter outline and descriptions, um, you know, all of the kind of meat and potatoes um, of what your book will be that you include in the, in the book proposal. So, you know, I think no more than two paragraphs. Remember, you have to keep your query letter to a page. Um, and if you, you know, if you look at what, what Craig's letter tells me, you know, about what the book actually is, it's not a ton, right? I, I know that it will have 80 recipes for broth, chowders, bisques, boils, and stews. You know, I know that the recipes are intended for home cooks and that they lean towards accessibility. Uh, I know there's a sustainability through line and that's enough. You know, once I get into the proposal, I'll find out, for example, you know, whether he features that message of sustainability mainly in the headnotes to the recipes or if he has devoted background chapters to help readers understand the issue of overfishing. Um, he doesn't need to explain all that. I'll, I'll, I'll see it and, um, uh, and, you know, and I, I find out, in fact, he does have several chapters on um, the problem of overfishing. Um, all right, and then the next part is we have to know that this author is the right author for this book. And um, in this next paragraph, uh, I, you know, I start to get a sense um, of who Craig is uh, what, you know, what his expertise is, um, and, and what his platform looks like. And I, you know, I know platform is a scary concept. Um, and I, I don't remember who said it might've been, um, Jane Friedman, who has uh, some wonderful resources for authors. Um, but platform is really just your, your access to readers attention. Um, and that, that access is built both on your direct following, you know, such as the number of subscribers to your newsletter or listeners to your podcast um, or people who have attended your talks, um, but also your indirect potential following through your helpful connections. So first, you know, let's look at his expertise. Craig has already written three books on soups and he's got credentials as a uh, nutritional therapist. That seems pretty solid to me. You know, I, I don't question why he's writing this book. Um, for his direct access to readers, he's got an active blog. He's got an author website. Um, and, you know, presumably some of his readers of his previous three books will also buy his fourth book. So, it, you know, it might look a little bit um, maybe even crass or boastful or whatever that he included the sales figure. Um, he says he's earned $60,000 uh, as a self-published author. Um, honestly, I, I found it helpful. I can do a little bit of quick math. Um, you know, I, I guess he sold around 6,000 books, you know, maybe, maybe even 10,000, you know, 10 to 20 bucks a book, maybe um, about 2,000 copies um, per, per book, something like that. 
um, you know, I can work with that. It's not overwhelming, um, but you know, he didn't sell his book to his six best friends and his extended family. You know, he, he sold it to the public. Um, all right, and then in this next, uh, the next slide, we'll see, or the next paragraph, we'll see his, his sort of indirect potential following, the, the connections um, he can lean on for book promotion. Um, and, you know, this paragraph for me uh, tells me that Craig is a professional, you know, and I want to work with authors who are professionals. It makes my job easier. And, you know, I don't have unlimited time. Um, I want to work with authors who know what they're doing. So I, you know, I don't mean by professional that he's a professional author. Most of my authors have day jobs. They're academics. They're journalists, they're chefs. Um, I just mean that he knows what is expected of him from agents and editors. Um, and so let's let's ask, like, why does that paragraph tell me that? One, um, you know, he he read and followed my submission guidelines. That's kind of the basic one. So he knows, you know, from my submission instructions on my page, I ask for book proposals to come in as PDFs. Um, and the reason I do that is just because I, I, you know, I like to um, be able to open them and read them wherever I am, whether it's on my phone or on my laptop, and I find it easier to do that on a PDF. Um, the next one is, is more nuanced. Um, you know, he has a, a promotional plan that includes uh, the fact that he already went out and got great endorsements already. Um, so, you know, if you get an inf influential endorsement early, it sort of, it eliminates any doubt um, in my mind that uh, your connections are real. And editors love to see it because these like early endorsements can easily become back cover blurbs later um, with, with the person's permission. So um, I didn't, I didn't actually know Jeremy Su uh, Sewell, Sewell uh, but I definitely knew Barton Seaver. Um, and that, that caught my eye. He had already had a quote from Barton. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, unfortunately, like this is the time to call in favors. Um, you know, you, you do really need, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, you, you, you wanna, you wanna put aside your bashfulness um, and you don't necessarily need to get these endorsements at the proposal stage. I do think they help. Um, but you definitely need to think through who you know and um, how they might might be helpful to you um, in promoting the book. Um, okay, so let's move on to, and again, this is succinct, just a page, um, and it, it hooked me enough to have a phone call with him, you know, a week later and sign him. Um, thanks, Martin, sorry. All right, let's move on to the dreaded book proposal. Um, all right, the book proposal, it, it helps flesh out what the book will be, who will read it, and how the author can help the publisher get it into uh, those readers' hands. It's, it's a business plan, um, and it usually consists of the following sections. You know, an overview of your book, uh, a summary, identification of the likeliest readers and why, a plan for how you can help the publisher promote the book to those readers, a few related titles and some analysis that shows how your book differs from or improves upon those works. Um, your author bio about, you know, about the author, a table of content uh, and uh, descriptions of each chapter. Um, probably shouldn't be too long, but you know, paragraph, two paragraphs, three paragraphs, you know, just uh, something that says you've actually put thought into um, what each of those chapters will look like and one to two sample chapters. So I'm not gonna go through every section of the proposal, um, but I, I just don't have time. Um, but I did wanna focus on a few areas I think authors really struggle the most with. And the first is the target audience um, or market analysis. Uh, I think there's two types of target audiences, uh, broadly speaking, depending on whether your book is more prescriptive or narrative. So. The first is people whose problem you are solving. Uh, as an example, I sold a book called The No-Nonsense Guide to Divorce, and it was aimed at divorcing millennials. 
And the author convincingly argued that millennials are entering their peak divorce years and were looking for advice on topics that traditional divorce literature omits, like the use of co-parenting apps or how mediation works, what happens when unmarried partnerships dissolve, other just pragmatic advice. Um, and that, you know, that felt like a book that was solving a real problem. And then there are people, you know, who are readers because they have a passion for your subject or for a closely adjacent subject. So, you know, here you might want to imagine you're at a cocktail party. Whose eyes would light up if you described your book to them? You know, not the ones who would politely listen, um, but the ones who know something about the topic already and are just jazzed to discuss it with you. Uh, so, for example, I represented a maritime adventure memoir called All, All Hands on Deck. Um, and it's, a, it's about the author's time as a carpenter on a replica 18th century warship that he and a small crew sailed 5,000 miles from Rhode Island down through the Panama Canal over to California to film Master and Commander. It's kind of this um, life imitating art situation where they hit a hurricane and they had a demasting and they almost sank and they ran into like these like real world pirates in Panama. Um, so. Point is, Will identified in the proposal two primary and overlapping audiences. The first were tall ship enthusiasts, um, many of whom belong to yacht clubs, and the second were Patrick O'Brien fans. And you know, if you don't know Patrick O'Brien, he was the author who wrote the the maritime novel series um, that included Master and Commander. So now, you know, Will is on a really successful author tour. Um, those, you know, you probably have heard uh, are not super common anymore, but he is getting invited to speak at every yacht club and maritime museum in the country and some in the UK, um, shockingly. So, you know, it, that's a picture of him at the New York uh, Yacht Club um, giving a talk to like 350 people, all of whom bought the book. Um, that's, you know, that's just knowing your audience. It's, I think um, it's not a huge audience, right? Like. I think the last estimates I saw were that there's about 300,000 members of the Yachting Club of America, which is kind of like this big over, overarching club that has a lot of different individual yacht clubs in it. So it's not enormous, but those are passionate and you know, frankly wealthy people. So it, it's proven to be a really excellent audience. Um, and I think that, that kind of like narrow but deep audience, it, it tends to work the best. Um, but whatever you do, don't don't just kind of claim ridiculously broad readerships. You know, women over 50 is not an audience. Um, true crime readers isn't an audience. You, you have to be more specific than that. Um, so, you know, for example, you might say like light true crime readers who enjoy stories of con men operating in um, insular worlds, like, you know, such as the billionaire's vinegar, people who avoid the bloodier end of the true crime genre. That's not even a perfect audience, but at least you're starting to get there. Um, so, you know, just just really have a think and 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 try to try to kind of narrow down um, uh, because um, I, I just get a lot of of I get a lot of submissions that are sort of very data centric, but they're the data is sort of like about the American reading public writ very large um, and, you know, uh, it's nice to know like what some recent true crime trends are, um, but but you you have to kind of visualize um, an ideal you know uh, reader, and that's that's not easy to do. But I think um, I think it's about specificity. All right, um, the the next uh, piece I wanted to point out is is sort of about expertise. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest differences between fiction and nonfiction is that the author's background and credibility, it really matters. Um, you know, with, with nonfiction, it isn't just about how well you write, but also how much I, I trust what you're saying. Um, so I want to uh, preface this by saying and reassuring everyone that I saw and loved Barbie. Uh, but for our purposes, Oppenheimer is a more useful example. Um, so you might know that Christopher Nolan based Oppenheimer on a book called American Prometheus. Um, and the, the primary uh, author, um, Martin Sherwin, 
you know, who was he? He was an academic who specialized in the development and proliferation of nuclear weapons. He taught at Princeton, UPenn, Berkeley. He established the Center for Nuclear Age History and Humanities at Tufts. Um, and he spent two decades writing American Prometheus uh, before eventually bringing in a co-author, um, a guy named Kay Bird, um, who had uh, written a number of bylines that related to nuclear, not, uh, nuclear proliferation. Um, in to kind of help finish it. Um, he needed some help on the writing. So, you know, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you get Kanaf to bite. And I know this sounds elitist, and I know, you know, it sort of says, it, you might think I'm telling you to stay in your lane, and you absolutely don't need a PhD to write, you know, most nonfiction books. But I, I do think it's worth being aware of the fact that the overwhelming bias in traditional nonfiction publishing is to sign books by people who have some verifiable claim uh, to subject matter expertise. So, you know, if a tax attorney comes to me with a new theory of what killed the dinosaurs, um, and he has no relevant degrees or publications uh, in, you know, uh, reputable journals, th that's an easy pass for me. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of exceptions uh, of authors kind of coming in from outside a field and shaking things up with a new perspective. I, I think of like, uh, I think Rachel Carson, um, Silent Spring. I don't, uh, I don't, I think she was a marine biologist. I don't think she had any knowledge of um, uh, toxicology before she started realizing the DDT stuff. Um, so, you know, it happens all the time. Take everything what I'm saying with a, a grain of salt. But, um, you know, I think, I think you, I think you will be better off um, and have a more kind of realistic chance of, of a traditional publishing deal if you know if you've if you spent the time to establish establish your reputation um, as as an expert on the topic before you try to land a book deal um, and you know different different kinds of books different genres require like different levels of expertise um, uh, and there are some that you know don't need it as much too. Um, you know, I don't know who wrote those like Atlas Obscura books, but like if you're writing uh, about ephemera and like, you know, just kind of oddities and things like that, I don't know if you need to be an expert. Um, but but for many, many nonfiction books, you, you do kind of need to um, have have some reputation um, in, in connection with your, your topic area. And then the last thing I'll say about this is like nothing succeeds like success it's way easier to kind of, uh, you get more latitude, um, you know, if this is your second or third book and your, your first and second, you know, did well, um, uh, you, you, you'll have an easier time moving on uh, to a topic in which you weren't necessarily known as an expert. But I, I do think if, if this is your first traditional book deal, like this has to be, um, you know, it has, it, you have to have some some following, some reputation, um, and some authority that you can point to. Um, all right, uh, what makes a good marketing plan? Um, all right, so let's say you can you can clearly show that readers will trust you, and they'll trust you enough to spend a dozen or more hours reading what you have to say on the subject. The next step is to show that you can help the publisher actually reach those potential readers. And that gets again back to the idea of platform. Um, Jane Friedman talks about how an author's platform is the work of a lifetime. And my impression is that authors often don't realize how deep their connections run. Um, you need to do a brain dump. You need to think about who you know in the media, uh, or friends who work at institutions that host authors, people whose name recognition might be suitable for a blurb or uh, even an early endorsement that can go in the proposal, as we talked about earlier. Um, and you need to do the same for your own career, uh, your past publications, your speaking engagements. Um, you know, you really, you really need to think of, about your platform as, as a holistic thing. Um, and, uh, you know, um, not everything that that you've done or everyone you know can or should be in a marketing plan, um, but uh, do the brain dump um, and then and you'll start to realize you know where you where you have um, uh, elements of a platform that you didn't you didn't think of before. The flip side of the notion that an author's platform is the work of a lifetime is that it takes time to build. And I often tell authors to come back to me 
you know, in six months, a year, two years, more, after they've put kind of significant effort into building their platform. Um, but, as, you know, assuming you have access to readers, I think the key to a good promotional plan is to convince editors and their colleagues in marketing and publicity that it, you know, it isn't a Potemkin village, that that your promises have substance, that your connections are durable. And I think agents and editors have, we've all been burned um, by authors that promise blurbs by Walter Isaacson and Reese Witherspoon and you know all the rest, and then and then they fall through. Um, you know, uh, get on Oprah is, is uh, <laughs> as the cartoon says, not not a marketing plan. Um, so you don't want to, you know, you want to be optimistic in how you frame um, your, you know, your your potential media coverage, uh, events, outreach to readers, but you don't want to be delusional. Don't don't overpromise and definitely definitely don't promise a bestseller. Uh, I just assume the opposite every time I hear that. Um, you also don't need to include like every possible activity you've seen other authors do. Um, you know, I see this a lot where, where authors think like maybe if, if their book has some sort of uh, um, industry or academic um, conference potential, you know, they think they have to uh, highlight how they plan to keynote a conference, even though they've never spoken at a conference before. You know, I think a good marketing plan puts your best foot forward by highlighting the platform you already have not the one you wish you had. Um, so, you know, focus on your strengths and you don't have to cover everything. And, you, you know, if if you're not a public speaker, if you're, you know, frankly, um, the thought of, of going on a podcast absolutely terrifies you, there, you can highlight other things. Um, you don't, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to include it just because you see other authors do it. Um, and, and then just, again, I think more, more can be less with the marketing plan. Um, I have seen so many authors recently just include like 50 or 100 people uh, who have agreed to read an advanced copy near publication um, to consider a blurb. You know, I, I honestly, I weigh that near zero. It feels like a spray and pray strategy um, and, you know, highlight real connections, like not people you call to emails who kicked the can down the road and said they, you know, maybe look at uh, manuscript once you've written it, it just, you know, um, that I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that helps your marketing plan in the way that some authors clearly think like more, you know, more is more, more is, is not always more. Um, all right. So we talked about how nonfiction, uh, you need one to two sample chapters. Um, and then again, the exception is memoir where you really need a complete manuscript. Um, as, as far as I know, I've sold a couple memoirs. I've always been able to show editors the full manuscript. Um, different agents sort of require different amounts of sample materials. So make sure to, to check their submission instructions. Um, and you know, beyond that, I, I suggest avoiding picking your introduction in most cases. Um, I think there's there's too much overlap in, often with the overview section of the book proposal, and you want every part of the proposal, uh, including including the sample chapters, to to feel fresh. Um, I, I get a lot of submissions that uh, are verbatim, you know, a page or two from the chapter, uh, from the introduction is the overview section that starts their proposal. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't want to be rereading material. It's, you know, uh, yeah, it, it feels like a waste of time. Um, so what do you pick instead? Uh, if it's if it's a prescriptive or, or persuasive book, um, I like to think about where you are breaking new ground. Um, so not necessarily a background chapter, not the introduction, um, but a, a chapter that advances uh, some original thought. Um, and then for the narrative, you know, more narrative works, um, like works of history, um, uh, just kind of narrative journalistic style um, uh, books, true crime, things like that. You know, I think about where the, the action is rising, where the pace is quickening, sort of that, uh, 
you know, that rising action leg of, of the traditional storytelling arc that you see up on the screen, I think it can be really effective for drawing agents into the story. Um, and, and just as it is for readers, um, it's, it's, you know, the part that gets your blood up. Uh, and that's what you want, frankly, in the proposal. Um, I also think it's helpful to, to show a range of content types if there's more than just text. So for example, I agented a book called uh, Exploring the World of Japanese Craft Sake, and it opens with a, a sake primer with educational infographics about sake, and then it more, morphs into more of a sake travel, travelogue. The authors um, go from uh, sort of all around Japan to all these like multi-generational 500-year-old sake breweries, and they meet the owners and the brewers and stuff. And the authors in the proposal included some of those infographics um, from the, the Saki Primer chapter, uh, and then a really fun chapter from the travelogue. And I, I thought that was great. Um, and I, I certainly got a pretty good handle of what the book would be uh, once I saw those two chapters. All right, uh, so a couple of final thoughts. Um, First is give your book a title. I get a lot of uh, untitled submissions. Um, and I, I think even if you're deeply ambivalent about the title, I'm just usually pretty unimpressed by submissions that come in that way. Um, it, it just suggests to me that you know, you're so overwhelmed by the querying process that you're afraid to misstep with the wrong title. Um, titles change, they change all the time. Um, you know, that's fine. A, a wrong title is better than no title. You know, give it, give it a, give it a try. It's sort of like the hook, like don't just sort of, uh, you know, abstain from, from that responsibility. Um, next is that, uh, you know, don't save your book ideas for your book. Okay. I see this a lot. Authors are so afraid to cannibalize, um, their ideas to cannibalize their book by giving away um, sort of the, the underlying uh, research or the underlying ideas um, uh, before they sell the book to a publisher. And I think in most cases, getting right readers to connect with you, um, to connect with those ideas through articles, op-eds, you know, newsletters, et cetera, and, and then expanding them into book form, it can only help you sell the book. It's like a proof of concept for the publisher. Um, and, um, yeah, don't, I, I think, I think with some exceptions, um, it is rarely a good idea to sort of go into your cave, write your book, try to land a traditional book deal without ever having talked about any of the ideas, uh, that constitute that book. Uh, in a in a public way, like you're you're engaged in a public discourse that you know that that's what a nonfiction book to some extent is, um, and and I and I don't think it's a good idea to save it all for the book. Um, I, I think I think you want to test those ideas out a little bit um, in the public uh, sphere. Um, this is kind of a basic one, but. Um, I think in most cases, a book trailer is completely unnecessary. Um, but if you do do it, you know, do it much later in the book publication process. Uh, and the same thing for the cover, you know, cover is absolutely necessary, but it's not your domain. It's the publisher's domain. And hopefully if you have a good publisher, they will consult you and, you know, you'll have some dialogue about it. Um, but you look really eager and sort of overstepping if you send out uh, a query with your cover mock-up um, and and you know a, a trailer, um, I yeah I, I I don't it actually hurts. Um, uh, inbox with confidence, um, you know, even if you've been rejected by fifty agents and your last three books bombed, uh, you know, I don't need to know that. It's it's like dating, you know, too much honesty closes doors. Um, so, you know, it, I know it's hard. I know, I know rejection, uh, you know, listen, agents deal with a lot of rejection too, trust me. Um, authors, it's, uh, it's your baby. Uh, so it feels um, even more painful. Um, but, but don't, don't talk about the kind of sad story of your 
of your publishing life, to put it, you know, uh, yeah. Um, and then last thing is just, I, you know, I think book publishing is, is one research project after another. Uh, I think authors who take that seriously have a big advantage in querying agents. Um, so, you know, obviously there's many nonfiction books have, have, a, have a research component. Um, and not just the ones you expect, like I'm, I'm representing a memoir now by a, a woman whose sister was one of the first um, American, uh, Americans to receive a kidney transplant. Um, and she, the author did like an extremely deep archival dive and some original research on the history of transplants and donor lists. Um, and, and that research, like it, it ended up really complimenting the personal elements of her memoir. I appreciate it. I learned a lot. Like I, I think people read memoir and they still, you know, it's, um, uh, they still want to learn something, but, but, you know, even setting aside the manuscript, you know, you have to know all of the podcasts and blogs and magazines and related books where your readers your target audience seeks information uh, or entertainment relating to your topic. Um, so that's a research, you know, that's a giant marketing publicity, you know, audience research project. And then, you know, finding the right agent as a research project. And, and it never really stops, um, you know, every element, like just once the book comes out, uh, you know, they're, they're, Unfortunately, publishers um, have have sort of limited attention. So you you know you have a couple of months of their attention, hopefully, um, if you're so lucky as to get a, a traditional pub publishing deal. But then you know that there's there's a big burden uh, of kind of sustaining the energy and the momentum of your book, um, and so that involves all kinds of other research. Um, and I, I just think yeah, be the expert, like know your topic, but also like um, everything. Yeah, relating to, to how um, how you kind of promote your book. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's a little never ending, honestly. Um, but hopefully, you're the type of person who likes research because that's what nonfiction publishing is. Um, all right, and then just to round it out, a couple of resources for querying. The first um, two are you know helpful places to find agents. Um, then the next two are uh, a couple of um, all the agent, editor, um, blogs, and newsletters that have really good advice for querying, I think. I read them both, Jane Friedman's um, Electric Speed and, and Anna Sproul's Latimer's uh, How to Glow in the Dark. Um, and then Readsy, you know, I, I think if you can afford to hire a professional to review your proposal and query letter, I think Readsy has some really awesome agents and editors who can help you find your blind spots. Uh, my only advice there is that uh, I don't think you need to say you had professional help when you query agents. I get a lot of emails that are like, my proposal has been professionally reviewed and enthusiastically approved by Joe Bob. And all that does is amp up the stakes for you. Because um, you know, if I think it's a flawed proposal now, I can't really imagine how bad it was before. Um, so you know, I, I think get that help, but kind of get it quietly is my advice. Um, and then, uh, in the words of my friend, Julia Whelan, who wrote this book, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take some questions. Cool. Amazing. <clears throat> Sorry, amazing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, questions already oh. popping up. Uh, but yeah, before we get to that, uh, you yourself, do you offer query lesser and proposal reviews? I did. Yeah. I did like, one just uh, last week. Yeah. Oh, nice. So I guess uh, the big question is, like, uh, if uh, I hire you to review my proposal, can I then go around and go, okay, can you represent me now? <laughs> uh, no, and I actually say that. Um, I'm, I'm very clear about that when I take on projects. So I, I belong to um, something called uh, the um, uh, was it? Association of American Literary Agents, AALA. Um, and they, they updated their bylaws uh, last year to allow agents um, to uh, do this kind of uh, freelance contract work um, and query letter reviews, book proposal reviews, uh, everything like that. Um, but the, the caveat is that you can't represent um, an author who you've done that work for. And it kind of, there's an interesting history there. Um, there, you know, there was and there still are some pretty unscrupulous agents um, you know, it's not a particularly well-regulated industry. Um, and so there were agents 
who would uh, tell authors, um, I'm happy to represent you. I think you've really got something here, um, but you just have to pay me $2,000 because I got to completely rewrite your proposal. And you know they were doing that for projects that had no chance of selling. Um, they were just collecting money that way. So yeah, I am very clear if, if you know, Readsy is not the place to pitch me uh, if you want representation. You have to go to my website um, and uh, you can you know, email me. But, um, but on Readsy, uh, I am strictly there for, for the freelance work. Uh, cool. All right. Let's dig into some of the questions that people have been sending in. Uh, let me see. Uh, there was a good one here uh, about... Uh, oh, some people were, uh, I think, taking your mention about light stalking uh, as an invitation to stalk you. There was uh, some questions about where you may have gone to college uh, in Vermont. Uh, that, uh, I'm, I, I, <laughs> that, that's my closest friend. That's one of my closest friends. Garrett, Garrett and I went to Middlebury. Thanks, uh, Garrett. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it Sarah asks, uh, do you need a full book proposal for a memoir or is it treats it more like fiction than nonfiction? Um, so agents are, I think, a little divided on this and I, I think you should do more research. I, for memoir, require a book proposal. Um, and the reason I, I do, I don't think actually, not all editors expect to receive a book proposal for memoir. But if you think about the value of a book, a book proposal, I think it's, um, I don't think it's just for editors. I think it's for authors too. I, you know, I think a good book proposal forces you to uh, really hone your, you know, what the pitch is, um, what the, you know, um, what the, what the plan will be um, to, to, you know, successfully sell it. So uh, to, to promote it, um, you know, so I, I think a good book, book proposal, it, it clarifies in your own mind, um, you know, a lot. I can't tell you how many book jacket descriptions are taken directly out of the overview section of a book proposal. Um, it's where you put the most thought in. It's where, you know, you have to summarize in a pretty short amount of space um, what, what makes your book compelling. Um, so, you know, I find it really helpful, uh, and I, I don't. I don't just find it helpful to sell the book. I find it, you know, helpful at every stage of the book publishing process. Yeah, it's something we suggest to self-publishing authors as well to go through that process. It not only just like focuses you up, so you are writing to that target audience. It stops you from like, I'm just going to discover this book while I write it, which will, you know, end up maybe being something that has no constituency, perhaps. Um, exactly. We have a question here from Austin. Uh, if the author is the primary marketer, why should they submit to traditional publishers? Isn't that usually why it's worth the work to break into traditional publishing? So, yeah, so this, this kind of gets into the uh, evergreen debate um, on, you know, if publishers these days have more and more books they're publishing with fewer and fewer staff and less marketing and publicity resources, why do traditional publishing at all? Um, and I think there's different answers for, for different people. I mean, I, I, think, I think distribution and sort of um, sales access, you know, is a big one. Um, I, you know, I think like if you've self-published or if you've spoken to a self-published author, um, it, you know, it's very hard uh, to get any attention uh, for your book. And even though marketing and publicity staff do less than they used to, um, it you know it, I'm not saying they don't do anything at, by any means. And just because you're handing a document that has your ideas um, on what you know uh, what media outlets, um, what you know influential voices, um, and you know uh, et cetera. Um, uh, might, you know, might be the most fruitful to reach out to, you know, that they have their own contacts. Um, this is just to kind of augment that. Um, and yeah, like every author that I've ever worked with is in some way disappointed by the marketing and, and promotion they received 
from the publisher. Not every, but almost every. There is there is bound to be some disappointment. Um, but I think it. I think it. There is still like a lot of value um, in you know having you know some uh, some support, some a team, um, and uh, and the contacts that the publisher has from having published a thousand books and you know 500 sort of in the in your genre whatever um they you know they 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 have they you will you will be the subject expert um and you will tell them uh useful you know useful things they hadn't thought of you don't have to tell a publisher that they should try to pitch the new york times um but but you know they need help to kind of think about the more specific, smaller market um, stuff, and and that's where the author kind of brings to the table a lot. Um, but the publisher still has tremendous contacts usually. Um, this is sort of a related one here. Um, oh, I've already lost it. Um, sorry, there. Basically, oh yeah, here's one. Uh, Paul is trying to cut you out of the equation already, Max. If an author has a substantial platform and a credible marketing plan, what is the added value of an agent? Um, I think there's quite a bit. I mean, I, I think for one thing, unfortunately, uh, traditional publishing is is somewhat gated. Um, you know, there there are uh, a couple of, of sort of indie presses, um, you know, uh, that take direct author submissions. Uh, most uh, most traditional publishers only kind of accept submissions from agents. Um, that doesn't really answer the, the why. That's sort of just a, a unfortunate reality for authors. But the but I think there I think the value um, is that the agent can be the bad guy. It can be the it can be the bad guy in both directions. Like I I will not be doing my job if I tell um, an author. Um, you know uh, that they're they're right, and every time they kind of have uh, a crisis, and there's a lot of different moments of crisis in publishing. I mean, frankly, it's it's emotionally draining. Um, and the agent who is your kind of ally um, can also like tell you what is really happening because you you won't always hear it directly from from the publisher. It can kind of the agent can kind of steer you around the potholes. Um, and sort of be the bad guy to the publisher if they are truly disrespecting and, and sort of not uh, uh, not treating you very well. Um, so I, I think a kind of uh, you know it, it's you're not there alone is is a is a big one. Um, and you know I think even if you think you have an enormous platform, a credible marketing plan, um, you know I have never received uh, a proposal. You know that I went straight out to market with. I spend a lot of time improving it and trying to get a better deal uh, for my authors um, and and positioning the work to to, to sell. Um, so you know, I I don't know if you have millions of followers and, and you know and editors are coming to you breaking down your door uh, for you know uh, for a book deal. Um, you're in a you're in a really good spot and, and that's awesome and congratulations. Um, I think that's not most people. Um, and, and so I think for most people, you, you really do want an agent to be an ally and, and to kind of improve your, you know, your project. All right. Um, do one more sort of deeper question and then I'm going to do a quick fire set to lead us to the end. Uh, this one, uh, Jane's asking, how much does it harm your chances of landing an agent if you self publish first? Um, I think it's it's completely um, uh, situational, and I think actually um, Craig Fear was a pretty good example uh, for me to have included uh, for your question um, because it didn't it didn't hurt his chances at all. Um, you know, uh, he you know that that is a sort of interesting trend that's happening. Was a lot of people who self publish first, um, if you know if they have some moderate success. Um, and if they can kind of, um, yeah, just to show sort of uh, uh, that, you know, they, they were able um, to promote their book effectively on their own um, and, you know, sell it, uh, that that can be a, a nice, um, you know, interesting thing for, for traditional publishers. So I don't think it, I don't, I don't, I don't actually completely buy the premise. Um, I think what I will say, you know, I, I don't think it always, I don't. I don't think it often really hurts. It just depends. Um, 
you know, I, I think the, the thing I'll say though, um, is that if you self publish first, don't then expect you're going to be able to take the same book and sell it to a traditional publisher. That is extreme, you know, that's rare. And the only times that really happens is if your book was such a huge success uh, that, you know, that a, a publisher wants to invest in um, putting out their own edition. Yeah, you're not going to go like, oh, I've self-published my book and nobody was interested. Would you like to sell yeah. it? Yeah, that, does, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, cool. I'm going to quick fire uh, just a bunch of them. So we only need like a couple of sentences uh, on each of them. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, sorry, I had some lined up just here. I want to ask about a pen name. Can you change it? Can you set up a pen name and cha uh, for later and decide you want to change it? In nonfiction, when I guess a lot of it is about your personal platform and your own expertise, is it good to have like to write anonymously? I don't think so. Um, my personal like bias is pretty strongly against that um, because I think it gets back to what I was saying earlier, like. Uh, you know, who you are and what your expertise in nonfiction, can I trust what you're saying is so much of the equation, uh, you know, that, that a publisher will, and agents therefore will look at uh, that, like writing under a pen name, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't improve. I, I'm not sure why you would want to do that. Um, you know, your, your name and your, and who you are really matters in nonfiction. Uh, question here from Robert Levine. Please discuss uh, queries to several agents at one time. Do you like it when uh, potential authors are spreading their uh, attentions around to multiple agents? Yeah, I assume they are. I mean, unless unless you unless I get a query, you know that that says um, uh, you are the perfect person for this, and therefore uh, I'm giving you um, a you know uh, 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 sole submission, you know for for the next month or whatever, um, then, you know, that's different. But yeah, I, I, I assume uh, authors are simultaneously um, submitting and, and agents, you know, have to navigate this too. So like um, if I give an exclusive uh, submission on a project to a publisher, I say so. Um, and if I don't say so, then editors will assume that they are not the only ones receiving it. Um, so I think it's totally, totally fine. Uh, but I would, I would call it out specifically if you are doing an exclusive submission to an agent. Uh, Austin asks, what are typ typical royalty rates for, well, commission for agents and royalty rates for authors in traditional nonfiction publishing? Let's assume that they're first time authors. Yeah. So agents, it's easier to answer. The standard is 15%, um, and, uh, as high as 20%. If the uh, if the agent sells uh, a foreign uh, you know either foreign translation or foreign territory rights um, with uh, with a um, a co agent and then the co agent and the main agent split that commission ten ten so fifteen percent unless it's for foreign rights uh, in which case it can be about twenty percent um, for traditional nonfiction publishing um, the the author royalties. Um, really can vary quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, a university uh, press, you know, selling maybe primarily to an academic market can be as low as like, you know, six, seven, seven and a half percent uh, on, um, not on list. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so it's it's uh, on net, um, which is uh, different. And you can easily find the difference. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, it can be quite low. Uh, you know, for for other kinds of books, uh, a big trade you know trade book with the uh, Penguin Random House, whatever um, you know, you can get up to um, fifteen percent uh, on on list. Sometimes even higher. Um, it just depends. It really does. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, I think I've left a link uh, to our directory of literary agents. It's non comprehensive, but we started putting together a list of. Uh, literary agents uh, that we could sort of verify were real and not scammers. Um, so if you need to start researching, um, the resources that Max gave as well, um, what did you have, manuscript wish list and? I think, yeah, Publishers Marketplace, um, which honestly, if you have like $25 to throw down for like the one month uh, of access, you'll need to get all, you know, scrape all of the, 
agents who have been actively selling within your genre, that's the best $25 you'll ever spend. Um, I use it. I'm on Publishers Market Place, uh, you know, two hours a day, honestly. Is it like the trades? What's that? Is it like the trades, like all the sort of gossip and all the everything happening within the yeah. industry? So you, the, yeah, they'll, they'll do deal memos. So they'll, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you sell a book, um, you know, agents typically submit uh, a little, little blurb about the book. Um, it says who the editor was, uh, you know, the imprint, the agent, the author. Um, so, you know, you, you'll, you'll get kind of a running uh, list of, of what, what's selling um, in, the, in the market. And you can kind of drill down um, to, to your genre. Um, so if you're looking for who's been selling memoir, looking for who's been selling popular science, uh, you can see everything. Um, it's really great. Um, and then there's also a publisher's uh, uh, lunch, which is, uh, yeah, that's sort of the, the gossip of the publishing industry. It's a daily, goes out around noon every day. Um, it's great. Is it all blind items? What's that? Is it like blind items where they don't? We won't mention anyone's name, but uh, like... it, it can be. It can have that feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool, Max. Well, I want, really want to thank you for joining us for this one. It was great. People have been loving you there. Uh, anyone at home? Uh, I'll be hopefully finishing up a transcript of this in the next week. So if you go to the Readsy Live site, just Google it, uh, you'll be able to find the transcript there. Max, of course, is available uh, to work with you as an editor and to help you with uh, any queries and proposals. Uh, great. Max, uh, any any sort of passing words uh, for the folks who've stuck around till the end? Uh, my only parting words is I'm, I'm actually going on my honeymoon on August 17th uh, to September 6th. So that three-week period, I will uh, have my out of office. Uh, but. Once I'm back, uh, I would you know love to work with you, and uh, I just uh, so appreciate Martin. Thank you so much for for bringing me on. Uh, this was a lot of fun, and uh, I hope it was helpful for people. Thank you. Sweet, uh, yeah, Max, stick around. Uh, we'll have a chat afterwards. Everyone at home, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Bye.